departure here is basically I want to describe some of the systems level computer science that we're bringing to bear to assist Juan and teams like his in solving their computational problems. And, and, and as you've, you've seen from this particular talk, there's a vast amount of computer simulation that takes place to support and to assimilate the data from these experiments. And this, this kind of experimentation really pervades the field of material science, it pervades computational chemistry, it pervades a vast number of disciplines that, you know, almost all of which the Computation Institute is um, co collaborating with and, and involved with. So but before I get too, too deep, I just want to thank, you know, our funders, obviously, and the, the team that is at the, the core of the, um, the computer science that we're describing here, the SWIFT team. Uh, I think uh, Justin Wozniak is at, uh, in the Argonne audience, uh, Tim Armstrong is here, and many others on the team are involved on both Argonne and the Computational, and the, uh, Computational Institute side. And, and especially we want to thank all of the different scientific groups and the individuals who collaborate with us. It's, it's really an honor and a, a privilege to try to um, work with you and apply computer science to meet your needs. Um, so, so just to sort of motivate, you know, one sort of one focal example from Juan's field is in the, the study of how materials behave at the, the junctions of, uh, of diverse materials. And I'm not going to dive at all into the, the scientific aspects. What I really want to focus on here is the computing problems that arise from these kinds of experiments, these kinds of investigations, these disciplines, and talk a little bit about how we solve them at the highest level. And, and I'll, I'll, we'll see in a moment what I mean by high-level problems in system science versus um, low-level problems. So in, in studying this, this kind of uh, phenomena, like, like I said, a, a vast number of computational codes are employed on the simulation side. So we, the, the disciplines will take, you know, years or even decades of experimental findings that are determining the coefficients and the, you know, the constants and the, the models, the computational models that are used to sort of go beyond what you can do in an experiment and to do simulation to either explore wider, vaster phenomena, do things at higher resolution, or confirm experimental findings, or do the do the simulations that will basically set up the next rounds of experiments. So there's an extreme, extremely synergistic and, and critical interplay between simulation and experiment. So in, in doing these, this kind of work, um, in, in like studying the junction that, that I just showed you, um, several uh, computer science codes, the, the LAMPS, molecular dynamics code, the Smeagol, I think the quantum based, uh, code is, is applied here, and scientists apply these codes in patterns that we generally call workflows. In other words, the methodical and repetitive um, execution of these codes um, in various patterns, sometimes as ensemble studies to study a range of parameters, sometimes in studies that are reducing data from experiment or modeling what's coming back from an experiment. But in, in almost all cases, we see patterns like this, where um, initial runs are done to sort of shape the model. Maybe that's done by one simulation tool. In this case, it's the LAMPS tool. Then later, the output of LAMPS is then funneled into a, a different modality and used to sort of shape an initial system. And then the scientists here are using Smeagol and Siet, um, the Siesta tools to actually do the, the uh, actual models. And then finally, after lots of parallel computations are completed, um, results are um, post-processed, integrated, summarized, and visualized to, in many cases, to produce the beautiful movies that, that Juan showed you. And another, um, so in, in, in cases like, like this one, um, some of these computations are fast and can be done almost anywhere. Some are very specialized, and these codes are only running on some of our largest supercomputers. And it's even a challenging problem to figure out how to you know, specify these kinds of loops and simulation patterns. And, and that's really the challenge that we're going after. 
And these patterns are kind of diverse. In, in other aspects that are of science that are driven by um, modeling molecular dynamics behavior, in, for example, in drug discovery, um, scientists are trying to understand how various chemical pop compounds will affect the proteins that are behind the causes of, of various diseases or, or health syndromes. So these kinds of problems yield a basically a large computational search where you want to take the, the molecular description of a chemical compound, the much more detailed description of a protein, and maybe take several proteins that are involved in the syndrome and compare a vast number of potential drug compounds for a fit in a, in a process called molecular docking. So there's actually yet another application code, a large family of application codes. The one that uh, is being used here is actually called DOC, the, the DOC6 application. And these kinds of problems result in hundreds of thousands or even millions of invocations of that tool. So this is a pattern that in computer science we've come to call many task computing, where the, the problem really breaks down into you know, a large number of invocations, and the tasks are invocations of these uh, complete molecular dynamics applications. So where, where we're evolving to is a programming model that tries to describe this. And in, in some, some cases, we borrow a term that kind of comes from the 1970s, which is called programming in the large. And what we're trying to do here is to find good ways to express the kinds of computational workflows that I just showed you. And what we've been doing here at the Computation Institute um, really for um, well over a decade is applying increasingly sophisticated and increasingly um, usable and adapted programming models to this problem. So these problems um, and, and this, this attempt. Uh, I don't think anyone can hear you at all. Yes. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll hold it here. I, I give up. Um, I, I, um, so, so what we're trying to do here is applying a, a programming model that we now call SWIFT to this problem of how to express these kinds of computational workflows. And we sometimes refer to SWIFT as a parallel scripting language. It's a scripting language in the sense that its whole purpose is to coordinate the execution of large-scale scientific or analytic codes. Okay? And so the, the model of computation here is typically running codes that may run for anywhere from seconds or fractions of a second all the way to small number of days in, in duration. So we have vast uh, different length, you know, length scales of computation. The codes may run on a single core or may take hundreds of thousands of cores each. And you know, very often these, these codes are programmed themselves using a parallel model like NPI, OpenMP. The codes may be GPU enabled and use CUDA or OpenCL and other, other programming models. And that's a problem that we, in, some, in, in this particular context, we somewhat jokingly refer to that as programming in the small. In other words, we're not focused in, in this particular um, uh, field in how we program the scientific codes. We're focused in how we coordinate their execution patterns on increasingly large, diverse parallel machines and distributed environments. So um, SWIFT, our, our our, uh, our uh, programming model automates the parallelization of, of codes. So in other words, if I have to run 100,000 copies of doc, Swift will automatically determine which parts, you know, which doc runs can be parallelized and executed when. It, um, it uh, sort of jump ahead to it. It um, deals with issues of data distribution, and its basic fucking goal is to hide all the complexities of running large, pro uh, large simulation or analytic campaigns across diverse high-powered resources and let the scientists focus on the actual domain problems on the discipline and not have to worry about issues of shell scripting, the data transfers between applications, or writing code that sort of knows how to talk to each scheduler you're, you're confronted with and things like that. And this this uh, approach is really geared toward a collaborative environment that I showed here. In other words, the scientists um, 
develops a high-level script that describes just the logical flow of the simulations they want to do, um, presents that Swift to, to the, presents that script to the Swift language, which then locates the data files that are called for in the processing, um, transfers those files automatically using um, a diverse set of facilities, including um, the Globus data transfer services, to the computational facility if it's not already there, um, runs the apps as needed, brings results back to either temporary or persistent locations, and then updates catalogs that are enabling users to store both the methods, the inputs, the results, the basically the, the traceback of the processes that were run to enable sharing, to enable assessment of results, to enable um, replication of results. And, and then finally, once these, these, all, these, these methods are now in a shareable place, the uh, tracebacks and the log records of all the previous computations done by an individual or group are now in a shareable place. So this facilitates um, collaboration between scientists within a group and between groups and between, you know, within the field as a whole. So this is the important collaborative model that the, the programming model here is just a part of. The, the, the overall goal is to tr create a methodology backed by tools that facilitates this kind of interchange. So an example of what Swift looks like is a, you know, a simple high-level script to do um, intensive, large-scale execution of lower-level scientific codes. So the example we showed earlier, where you have a small number of proteins and a vast number of ligands that you want to dock um, against those proteins, this kind of simple, high-level logic will express that. So notice that in this kind of statement, there's no um, there's no explicit logic about how many apps to run at once. There's no explicit logic about where data has to move to. All of that is separated out. <coughs> the scientist is presented with a, a relatively high-level logical view of the problem they're trying to solve. So Swift, you know, this approach, which is at the heart of, of the research that, that our team is doing, um, does four important things for you. So first and foremost, it determines when things in your workflow can be parallelized. So you don't have to explicitly um, do message passing or um, use mutual exclusion kinds of primitives like you do in MPI and OpenMP to um, coordinate your parallelization. Everything is done by data flow. So what Swift is really doing here is taking a concept, this, this data flow concept, which has been um, coming in and out of vogue in computer science literally since the mid 70s, and now using that concept to make a transparent, a practical approach to parallel scripting of applications. And like I said, it does the, the other functions, which are transparent um, data, data movement, um, transparent retry of failure. So if you're running 100,000 um, you know, instances of doc over some large period of time, you're going to run into failing machines, failing data transfers, and things like that environment retries those so that you don't have to infiltrate your scripting logic with all the, the failure and error handling. And finally, it, it records the provenance of what was done. And this is the vital piece that gives you like a trace back of a log record of, of your processing. So this has been applied to a large number of fields. Um, it's, it's very suited to fields in which we see this pattern of applying um, application codes to data sets um, using application codes for simulation. So uh, it's been applied to studies of glassy materials. Um, that, that was worked by uh, Glenn Hockey at Columbia now, now here. Um, it's been applied to, um, uh, to uh, molecular docking. It's been applied heavily to protein structure prediction. Um, in, in other fields, it's been applied to um, subsurface modeling, that's the red and blue picture in the middle, to modeling of the um, power grid, um, sort of supply and demand um, economic models and reliability models. Here in Chicago, um, the, the uh, RIDSET project 
and related projects face it are doing modeling of global food supply with economic factors. Um, Ian Allison but is involved in, the, in those projects and leading them. Um, it's applied to, you know, back on the molecular field, it's applied to um, um, biomolecule interaction. I think the bottom is uh, protein RNA um, interaction modeling done by uh, people in Token Sausage Group. So, so this, so this um, approach now is starting to take root. We've been, um, SWIFT was sort of born roughly in, in um, 2006, 2007. And now we're at the point where we've got about 25 active scientific collaborations across diverse domains uh, using it. So back, back in the um, molecular dynamics space, the uh, NAMPI group in uh, Klaus Schulten's lab at Urbana has recently um, taken advantage of the latest high performance uh, version of SWIFT that was implemented by uh, Tim and Justin to um, enhance the programming of um, higher level macro functions inside NAMD and its, its counterpart utility in NAMD. So those, those utilities have, you know, these have been you know, a major uh, workhorse in the molecular dynamics field now for I think almost two decades if not longer. And from the beginning these tools were augmented with the tickle scripting language to try to provide high level flexibility for um, simulation and utility functions that, that people can program above the core molecular dynamics model. Um, Swift, our, our latest version of Swift happens to use tickle as an embedded internal language and it turned out to be very productive to now um, express the coordination of those MD and VMD tickle functions through, through Swift logic. So this was done by um, Jim Phillips and John Stone, and they've been able to, for example, take the replica exchange problem, which is a, you know, a common molecular dynamics uh, um, simulation paradigm, and you know, by calling existing tickle functions in, in the large body of NAMI tickle code, came up with a much more compact, productive, easy way to specify that. So by, you know, by lifting out the signal from the noise, we're now able to to really let scientists focus much more clearly on their core logic problem and not go as, as deeply you know, tied down in the minutia of expressing the problem. Now in, in other areas of material science that, that really highlight the, the paradigm of linking simulation and experiment, this is a, uh, a project called Discovery Engines for Big Data. It's led by Ian, supported by the RGAR. Um, LDRD program, and what this project is doing is looking at two diverse fields, material science at the APS and cosmology. So I'm only going to talk about the, the material science side here. And in material science, the, the project is really applying the same kinds of principles that I've been talking about. The notion of easier expression of the computational processes, augmenting those computational processes with catalog metadata and catalog provenance so that we can store data, for example, coming off the APS beamline on high performance Globus accessible servers to make it very ubiquitously available at very high data rates, and then to catalog that data in the Globus catalog so that collaborators both inside and outside can access, locate the data, discover the scientific meaning of data through its metadata attributes, and then apply those, uh, apply computational procedures that are developed in, in this high-level programming paradigm to those data sets. So here we're zeroing in on a particular, um, a particular mode of studying materials, typically metals, called the high energy diffraction microscopy. So this is kind of one of the one of the few techniques in, uh, that, you know, with any kind of imaging modality that lets you peer inside a metallic object and determine its granular crystal structure, um, non-destructively without destroying without a sample. So, for example, this is work that's looking at samples provided and funded by GE for things like you know, better engine turbine blades and. Um, uh, parts for an engine that can withstand combustion stresses and things like that. Um, 
So uh, this is actually showing one of our collaborators, Saman Sharma, at the beamline at Sector 1. Um, the left side is uh, this microscopic, well, not microscopic, it's, it's, it's enormous by that those standards, but a, a small pin of, of high-tech alloy, um, the same alloy sitting in the experimental hutch um, with a camera on it. Um, and then there's all these, you know, the, the complexity of what you face at the beamline is really pretty astounding. So when um, experimenters, well, first of all, beam time at the APS is incredibly valuable. If you think it's hard to get supercomputing time, you know, beam time is, is even more costly and uh, kind of awarded in chunks of a few days to five days, uh, typically. And an experimenter gets in there, they have to, within their five-day allocation, set up their apparatus and start, you know, confirming that the apparatus is, is behaving correctly and then start taking data. So in, in this case, we've you know, built this and, and are actually continuing to build out this kind of computational infrastructure that links um, local parallel clusters that are you know, within the APS, um, close to the beamline, storage servers that are close to the beamline, that more global storage servers that are um, can hold, you know, have greater capacity than what the, uh, the beamline um, storage servers can have and also have greater bandwidth to the computational resources where we want to process things. So in, in this environment, we've integrated um, Globus data transport services and Globus cataloging services with the processing resources that are available at Beam within the Argonne uh, laboratory-wide computing facility, LCRC, and at the ALCF with the large Fuji uh, supercomputer Mira and its it's, uh, it's small partners. And we've enabled these, these facilities through SWIFT to, to be able to use this complex architecture as if it's your personal scientific workstation. So this is a, just a small glimpse of what we're doing at the ALCF um, to integrate SWIFT, both, both SWIFT running as a textual scripting language and SWIFT running through the Galaxy um, web-based interface for both drawing and executing workflows. So Haman Sharma and his colleagues were um, able to take um, one of the variations of their HEDM method, the near field in which the, the sample is, is very close to the detector. And I'm not sure what uh, I've lost the uh, Anyways, so in, in a near field experiment that was that was recently done, we got we got a kind of a kind of a dramatic confirmation of exactly what the Discovery Engines project was seeking to do. And that is to have experimenters in beam time be able to run their experimental results through the analytic um, data processing pipelines that will eventually you know, convert you know, raw data to, to usable information. And um, Hamad was able to determine by, by coupling his data emerging from the beamline almost directly to the Mira supercomputer that with, within his first data collection round, he could already tell that the experiment was not working. And so, you know, he, so he, ran, he ran from experimental data all the way through data transport to Mira, swift scripts running on, I, I think he had reserved some, some large number, somewhere between 64K and 128K cores on Mira for, for the duration of, of his uh, early, early beam time. And he was able to determine that there was something wrong. He went, shut things down, went back into the hutch, and um, found that a cable was constraining the detector uh, robotics and was giving skewed results. Fixed it, re-simulated, and was now able to confirm that he's getting data that is at least good enough to continue on with his beam time. So that was, that's exactly the kind of scientific productivity that these methods are, are seeking to you know, make available and to, to make commonplace. And so other, um, other uh, experiments at the APS, also in the Discovery Engines project, are um, working on problems in similar but different areas of material science. This one is about diffuse scattering with uh, Ray Osborne and collaborating with, uh, with Justin Wozniak to couple 
uh, crystallographic simulation with beam time experiments. And, and the, you know, the, the science is, is quite radically different, but the methodology is the same in, at the highest level in terms of using this cyber infrastructure and advanced high-level scripting techniques to let scientists focus on method and on the, the coupling of simulation to experiment and not get bogged down in, in the minutia of uh, scripting in the computer. So, so where do we want to take this? Um, there's a lot of work to be done still in terms of engineering, testing, usability, um, dissemination of this methodology. But in, but in the research area, there's lots of new opportunities that we we are just just starting to uncover, just starting to tap. Uh, one of the exciting ones is this concept of in situ um, analysis. So the, the, the problem with many simulation domains, the, the domain shown in this example happens to be climate, but the same thing applies in material science when you're simulating at you know very large scale and high fidelity, that you cannot in all cases, move the data out of your supercomputer fast enough to be able to analyze it and make decisions that guide the simulation, or even even take advantage of the you know high fidelity results that you're getting. And the me the methodology, or one methodology that's being used to address this is in situ processing, where you literally put the analytics very very close to the source of the of the uh, data emerging out of the computation. So this is a process where we're trying to ask the question, can we take the high level, implicitly parallel methods that we're exploring with Swift and literally embed those methods, those, those um, scripted procedures for analysis deeply inside the large scale computation so that you can you know, take advantage of all of the computational power without having to move out all the data. Um, so other areas that we're exploring is how we can use our data flow methodology to reduce power consumption in large scale simulation and analytics. Because in data flow, you, you have much greater knowledge of what areas of the co overall computational pipeline are in use and needed at a given time. So theoretically, it's possible to um, shut down anything from cores to complete racks of equipment as your computational needs ebb and flow. Um, we're, we're looking at issues like how we can learn from the MapReduce programming model and its, its, um, its optimizations of data locality and, and data placement to more efficiently do SWIFT-based analysis. Um, and the usability side again, we're looking at how we can turn the SWIFT programming model to a very interactive read-evaluate print model like, uh, like IPython uses and integrate with things like the IPython notebook and make it so that you can literally be scripting incrementally as you're exploring your data or you know, running your simulations and things like that. So those are some of the um, exciting things we have um, in the pipeline. And you know, I think in conclusion, what we're really seeing now in, in these last few years is that we're, we're getting good, solid confirmation that this methodology works and is worth it. In other words, at the time you spend moving your approach to simulation up to a higher level pays back in terms of scientific productivity, in terms of, you know, let, in, in other words, we're, we're now automating through relatively, maybe in hindsight, obvious techniques of functional encapsulation and data flow, automating things that, to date, we've been doing in a very low-level, painstaking manner. And, and I think, you know, our, our collaborations are showing that it's paying off. So if you're, if you're a scientist involved in one of these areas where you live and breathe simulation and analytics tools you know, for, for a lot of your endeavor, you know, we would love to work with you and, and, and you know, find this, you know, your, your problems very exciting and appealing. Um, we, we seldom go deep into science. Where we do is you know, we try to help you understand, to help, help by understanding your data flow needs and helping you to automate your processes. And if you're a computer scientist, this is a phenomenal um, project to get close to science. So we, you know, we work with a, a vast number of wonderful scientific collaborators, um, such as Juan 
and um, all the material scientists and, and chemists in, in this, this domain and, and in many, many disciplines beyond that. So it's a great place to um, apply ideas of high-level computer system science to uh, solve beneficial scientific problems. So I'd be delighted to take any questions. Thank you very much.